This isn't our normal setup, but I, I, I put this table and these chairs up here because we're beginning a new series today, and we're coming from the book of James, and the title of that series is Let's Talk About It. Let's Talk About It, and we've used the graphic, which I think they'll have up on the screen in a moment, that has the, uh, a table and chairs, because if you, if you study the book of James and you, you look into some of the background and, and the purpose behind it, James is a slightly unique apostle in that he wrote this letter and he was speaking to um, the, the, the believers that had been scattered abroad. He was a pastor of the, the, the earliest Christian church in Jerusalem where people had, had been, the, the Jewish folk had converted in a sense to following Jesus as Messiah and they were, they were being built up in their faith and then all of this persecution came in Jerusalem. And they, they were spread out, and people had to literally leave and move and flee because there was so much persecution in Jerusalem. But, but James had been serving faithfully for a long time as, as pastor and apostle. And he, he says it even in verse 1. It talks about just who he was. And he is a, 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 a speaking sort of from that pastoral heart. He's gained all of this wisdom. He was influenced by the Proverbs and, and by the teachings of Jesus, especially from the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. And, and James, like some other apostles that may be here in the room, has this way about sort of being in your face about things, of telling you how it is. He, James is the, the in-your-face, I'm going to get up in your business apostle, pastor, teacher. And so when he wrote this letter, it's, he's coming with that sort of tone. Look, I've, I've been through things. I've seen some things. I know you guys are going through things. You've seen some things. So let me just keep it real for you. Let's just talk about what's really going on, what you're really suffering with, and let's try to live this thing for real. There's 108 verses in James, and 54 of them, half of them, if you did okay in math, are talking about challenges to how to live out your faith in a real practical way. And so that's why we're titling this series, Let's Talk About It. Let's sit down together, let's, just, let's look at the Word of God, and let's let it speak to us about what's really going on in our lives. If you've been here long, hope you realize we're not a church that's looking for fluff and, and just trying to make you a better you. We're trying to help you live out of faith for real so it has a real impact. Amen. Now, I'm, this is not necessarily unique, but I still ask for your grace because if James is coming that way, then me and Pastor Corey may have to come that way too. So let's talk about it. So turn with me to the book of James. I want to start right away in the first chapter. And for today, what I want us to talk about is what James decided was apparently most important to start his letter with, and that's how we deal with trials. So the title of this message today is, Should We Really Enjoy Trials? I mean, let's be honest. If we want to have a real conversation, we don't really like trials. We don't really want to have to go through struggles. We don't have to want to have to deal with pain and, and suffering. I mean, we really don't want that, do we? But wait a minute, are we supposed to enjoy that? Are we supposed to be grateful to, that, we have going, that we're going through trials? Well, what does he say? Let's start with verses 2 through 4 in chapter 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So he's setting this purpose out right here. Now let me, let me just clarify something in case you think you may be excluded from this message today. He says, whenever you face trials of many kinds. He's, he's speaking to the assumption that at some point, you're going to go through a trial. It's not if you happen to face a trial, but whenever you face trials of many kinds. So it's going to happen. Someone has said you're either in a trial, going into one, or coming out of one. We all are dealing with things. And it says they're of many kinds. Some of the trials are the trials that we've brought upon ourselves because of the foolish choices that we've made or the sinful choices that we've made and we haven't followed in God's way and so now we're facing some trials and some difficulties because we put ourselves in those situations. Uh -huh. Now other times it may be a kind where you're facing a trial because somebody else did something to you 
Or you've been involved in a family or a group or a, or a class or in a work environment where you have to deal with stuff because somebody else has made the wrong choice or done something that God didn't want. And so now you're dealing with that. The other reality is that we're all facing trials in this world because it's full of evil. It's full of sin. And at this point in time, because of men's rebellion from God, we're still in this broken world. And so there's, there's oppression. There's discrimination. There's prejudice. There's abuse. There's still death in this world because of the reality of the state of sin that this world is in until the Lord comes again and rectifies that. Amen. So we have to deal with grief. We have to deal with loss. We have to deal with hatred. We have to deal with all of those things that create all sorts of pain and struggle for us. That's the reality. So in some shape or form, we're all dealing with trials. But what is the purpose and this, if you don't get anything else, this is the most important thing today. What is the purpose of trials that I'm going to be going through or am going through in my life? He says, it's, it's a testing that produces perseverance, but the perseverance must finish its work so that, there's your clue, it's leading to the purpose, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He's trying to produce a completeness, a maturity, a wholeness in you. And what is that wholeness? That means being made to look like Jesus. Okay. So here's the bottom line. The purpose of trials in our lives is so that we become more like Jesus. And some of you think, well, I can't ever be like Jesus. I, I have this, that, or the other. He has done that work in us. Those that have followed him and surrendered to him and are, are following him as disciples, he is able to like, make us like him. Yeah. That is the purpose. That is intention. But he needs to give us some tests and some trials to refine us, to shape us, and to mold us, to, to break off that flesh, to break off that sort of sinful nature, to break off some of those desires and temptations so that he can form us to be made like him. Well. So the purpose is to be whole, to be like Christ in every way. If you think about it, if you've read that first chapter of Genesis in there, I think it's around verse 26, it says that God made mankind in his own image. That's how we started. It was perfect at that time, and all sorts of things happened that messed that up. But the rest of the Bible is bringing us back to the point where we can live out his image. Let me, let me turn to Romans chapter 8 and show you what it speaks to there as Paul is writing about this in a, in a similar way. Verses 28 and 29 of Romans 8. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined, here it is, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he may be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So God is saying, for those that love me, all these things that you're going through, I'm, I'm working in them for good, for this purpose, that you would be conformed to the image of Jesus. Amen. Those things are happening in your life, whether it was initially good or bad, done by you or somebody else, but he's saying, I'm able to work in those things for the good of you becoming more like Jesus. That is his purpose for us, to be like him, to look like him, to act like him, to think like him, to love like him, to give like him, to care for others like him. That's his call for us. That's the purpose of these things that we're going through. I, th I think of this example there um, in, this, in Bible times, and I guess probably in current times, depending on where you are, there, there are um, people that work with metal, silversmiths, right? And they would, get, they would collect these metals, and they would have impurities in them. So in order to put them through the purification process, they would put them in a, a large pot or a cauldron and they would put fire underneath them and they would burn it at high heat. And what would happen is all the impurities would rise to the top. And then that once that layer of dross was there, they would, they would scrape it off, they would remove it, and now they've got pure metal. And here's the way that they would test to make sure that the metal had been completely purified. They would look over it to see if they could see their own reflection in that bowl. And in the same way, Jesus wants to look over our lives as he purifies us, as we go through those tests and those trials, and he wants to look down and see his reflection as we look like him. And then others see that as well, and now they're drawn to him. That is the goal, the purpose of those trials. 
But see, if you don't have that understanding, if that's not what you're committed to, what you're devoted to, then when the trials start to come and it gets a little hard, it gets a little uncomfortable, it gets a little painful, if you're not starting with this understanding that Jesus is trying to do something to make me more like him, then you're going to respond in your own way. And you're going to get your own results. And that image is not going to be crystal clear. It's going to be a little cloudy. And other people are going to be looking like, I don't know who he or she's representing. Because you're not responding to the trial in, the, in line with the purpose that Jesus has for you. you got to start there. I'm going to give you a few practical things to do, but they aren't going to matter if you're not devoted to the fact that this is the purpose for my life. So that whenever I go through something, I know it's because Jesus is trying to make me more like him. That's the purpose. That's where we begin. We've got to settle that. So look what he says then. Let me give you three ways that he encourages us and challenges us to deal with these trials, to deal with these struggles in whatever shape or form they take, physical, emotional, relational, financial, whatever it may be, or trials of any kind. Here's how you can deal with that. It starts what we already read in verse 2. Consider it pure joy. So I'm telling you that the first step he's speaking to us is that you've got to choose joy. Notice I said choose, and all of these steps are going to be choosing because there's a decision to be made. He's calling us to choose joy. In my version, in NIV, it says consider. In your version, it may say count it all joy. Consider and count were, they're, they're accounting terms. Because you would look at these situations and be like, God, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't add up. Anybody ever said that before? Let's be honest. Do we ever question that? God, why? I thought this doesn't add up. That's an accounting equation. But see, here's what happens. Then we try to solve that equation with a natural calculator. But God, I did this plus this, but it didn't equal this. So the natural calculator isn't adding up because you think this variable plus this variable e equals this result. But our math is off because we're not made to use a natural calculator. We're made to use a supernatural calculator that has a battery of joy that keeps it running. So the, the God sets the variables in the equation and he produces the result. We're just waiting to see how he's going to put it together. But we've got to operate with that supernatural calculator that says, I'm evaluating, which is what that word means, whatever I'm facing, I'm evaluating this through what I know his purpose is, that he wants me to be more like Jesus, so what is he going to do to help me get there? Maybe I don't know, maybe I'm looking for the answer and it hasn't come, but I know what the end result is going to be is somehow, in some way, I'm going to be made to look more like Jesus. And it's worth it because of that. It's worth it so I don't have to stay over here trying to work through my mind figuring it out where I get frustrated, I whine, I complain, I get discouraged, I give up, I stop coming to church, I stop giving, I don't talk to people no more because it's not working out. So I'm just over here unhappy or I'm finding things to give me some form of temporary happiness which still aren't adding up at the end and I don't really have joy. I've just got a momentary distraction from my pain. That's the natural operation. When God is inviting us to, to something deeper of joy over here. Like the same joy that Jesus had when it said, because of the joy set before him, he, he went to the cross. He saw the purpose. I don't know, I haven't had a chance to ask Jesus yet, but I don't think he was happy about being crucified. About people beating him and whipping him and calling him out of his name and all sorts of things. But he had a joy, he understood the purpose, so he was faithful in obedience. Because he knew the purpose. Paul, Paul said the same thing. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 10, he's talking about this thorn in his flesh. He was like, the enemy keeps bringing this thorn in my flesh. And he prayed to God three times, God, take this away. God, we want to have that happen too. God, take the pain away. Take this struggle away. Take my, my debt away. Take this lack away. Take this person away. But, but there's times where God's saying, look, no, hold up. You've missed the bigger picture. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. I can give you what you need to get through it. So stop trying to get out of it. I'm trying to teach you something through it. And my power is made perfect in your weakness. In your weakness. And he said, that's why for Christ's sake. I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
that doesn't make sense in a natural calculator that I'm weak, but I'm still strong. But over here in the supernatural, your weakness produces God's strength if you surrender to him. God has a different formula. He's got a different way. Which one are we committed to? Which one are we devoted to? Let me give you the second one. So then he says, not only do you need to choose joy, you need to choose to get help. You've got to choose wisdom. Verse 5 through 8, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Like I said, James ain't playing no games. He's just telling them the truth, just fresh, unfiltered. But it is, he's saying, look, you've got to choose to get God's help. I mean, if we're honest, when we go through these things, the truth is, God, I don't really know what's going on right now. This doesn't make sense to me in most cases. Or I don't really know what to do. How do I handle this? What should I do? That's, that's the honest response in most situations. So God is not asking us not to have questions, not to be confused, but he's saying, look, recognize that you need help, you need wisdom, come to me who, who has all the wisdom in the world and let me help you. He's just asking you to ask. Look what he says. He says, he gives generously to all without finding fault. God's not up there waiting to be like, oh, come on, Jose, you know, you, you don't know what you're doing. You, you just dumb, and why don't you come to me and admit it so I can, so I can you know, punish you. No, he's saying, look, I'm not going to hold it against you. Whatever the reason was, you may have done it to yourself, but I'm not going to hold that fault against you. I'm still going to give you my wisdom. So how do we respond? Let's be practical, because we, knew we, need, some under, we need something from God. Here's what I think we need to ask God. God, what do you want me to do or understand so that in this situation, in this trial, somehow you're going to make me become the best version of you? So what do you need me to do so that after I get through this, whenever that is, I'm going to look more like you? Because that was the purpose, right? So if we really want God's help, then you say, God, show me. Now, I don't know what God's going to show you. Sometimes he might show you, you just need to sit down, shut up, and wait. You just need to trust me and persevere because perseverance ain't done all its work. There's still a cycle that's got to run, so just be patient. Other times he may say, look, now is the time I'm going to bring your healing. Or now is the time that you need to let go of that person or of that job. Or now is the time you need to just get in and pray and fast and seek me and wait. But at some point, I'm going to say yes, no, or just keep waiting. So we don't always know exactly what God's going to say, but we know that we need to go to him and ask him. And we know that we need to ask him with the intention of, what do you want so that I can become more like you? That's it. But see, here's the problem. It says that too often we doubt. We become double-minded. So what does doubt look like? It's, it's, it's saying, yes, I believe. And then over on the other end is, no, I don't believe. Well, the doubt is the going back and forth. I've got some yes, and I've got some no. So you're inconsistent. You're going back and forth. Yes, God, you do say that in your word. I believe that. Well, then over here, it hits the fan and things happen, and you forgot what you said you believed, and you do the opposite. Well, then you go over here, and God, you pray, and God says, yes, you need to, you need to leave that job. I've got something else for you. But then you go over here and be like, but God, I won't be able to pay my bills if I leave that job. I don't like it, but I don't want to step out of faith, so I'm going to stay here. And then you, you know, come back over here, God, oh, yeah, I know you've got a spouse for me if I can just patiently wait and keep growing and seek you. But then over here, oh, there he is or there she is. And, oh, I don't know if I, well, let me just try this out even though God told me to wait. And, and now you're going back and forth. You've gone from yes to no, and you're blown like the wind and like the waves of the sea. Why would God want to bless that and, and speak to you and give you something when you can't even decide where you want to land? That's what he's saying. He's, you don't have to have all the answers. You've just got to surrender and trust him. Because God, what I want, if that's true, is over here for you to show me what you want to do. And if I start to feel that, I want to, God, help me to stay strong, to stay here. Yeah. But the doubting going back and forth, we do that in so many ways. Yeah. From small things to big things. From moments of the day to throughout the weeks and months, we waver. And then we wonder why, 
we're not becoming more like Jesus. We haven't, just, we haven't stood firm in a place with him to allow him to keep working on us. I don't know a whole lot about clay and pottery, but if you're trying to shape that pot and it's bouncing around, I can imagine that ain't, that ain't going to work too well. It's got to sit there and let, let, that, let that person shape it and mold it. It's got to sit and wait. But we can be double-minded. We can be unstable. Here's the last example. Because he knew... It's funny how people don't really change. He knew they would, they would struggle with trying to choose happiness over holiness, right, and really struggle to understand what really joy was. He knew they would struggle with seeking wisdom versus their own truth and doing their own thing. He knew people would struggle with that. He also knew people would struggle with turning to things, to their own material possessions, to resources, to try to find their way to provide some comfort through the trial. So what does he speak to? He says, not only do I choose joy, not only do you need to choose wisdom, you need to choose humility. Verse 9 through 11, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even when they will go about their business. Now, before you write that off and think that you're not rich, first of all, all of us in here are pretty rich compared to everybody else in the world. But whether, you, whether, you have, whether you're in poverty or prosperity, if you're clinging to things in any way, shape, or form as, as something that you look to for, for some help or some comfort or some way to get you through things that are, that are not God and the things of God, then somehow you've put these possessions, these, these flowers that will fade away, you've put them as priority in your life of how you deal and manage with trials. And he's telling them, look, if you have been humbled, if you don't have a lot, be grateful because what's the most important thing to have is to have treasure in Jesus. And if you've got treasure on this earth, just don't be too attached to it because it doesn't mean anything. Because let me tell you this, if, if you get told that you have a, a life-threatening disease, that money in your bank account, that nice car you drive ain't going to do nothing for you. If you find out that your children are denying Jesus and turning to some other faith and you've been praying for them, you can't pay them back into heaven. You can't drive them back in that Mercedes Benz. So what are you going to do? The reality is when the real stuff comes, the real hard trials come, that stuff ain't going to do nothing. It's going to actually hopefully humiliate you so you get back to the point of being humble that says, God, woe is me. Help me. I need your help. Let me get back over here and trust you. That's what he's saying here. To give God glory in whatever thing you have, whether you have a little or a lot, be content and, and operate from that joy. Operate from that wisdom and operate from that humility. And last, he leaves them some hope, which I leave with you today. The last verse we'll speak to is verse 12. It says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life. That the Lord has promised to those who love him. There is rewards to us going through these trials. First and foremost, we're made to be more like Jesus. Which is an amazing reward in and of itself. And not only in that progress of going through test after test and being approved. Which is what the word said. I approved. I recognize your faith. Let's go on to the next one. I'm proud of you, son. I'm proud of you, daughter. You're, you're ready for the next challenge. You're coming more like me. The father is just so pleased. And then, and then ultimately, right, we receive that crown of life, that eternal reward, which as we know, eternal life is, is really just relationship, knowing God, having relationship with him, which starts now here on earth and extends forever throughout eternity, that crown of life, that, that greatest graduation cap that we can ever receive, that, that ultimately we'll get to have forever with him. That's the reward. That's the motivation. So when we see these things, we're not looking at the immediate storms and circumstances. We have an eternal perspective that says, God, I want to be more like you here on earth, and I want to live with you every day for the rest of eternity. And what's the motivation for that? Look at that last line. It says that this is what the Lord has promised to those who love him. And it said this in Romans 8 too, that this is all because we love him. So if you have any other motivation for trying to, to be right, to be Christian, to be godly, to be religious, to, to impress others, to impress your pastor, to look like something to your neighbors, that's the wrong motivation. It's not about checking boxes. This is not about, you know, acting right and, and being super spiritual. This is motivated because of your love for Jesus. 
And because I love Jesus, I'm willing to go through whatever, whenever, wherever, however, so that I can become more like him. He's the one I want to be like. He's the greatest of all time. He's my idol. He's my savior. He's my Lord. What do I got to do to be more like him? Now, you may not always get excited about the answer, but the end result is worth it. I don't have a lot of experience in this area, but I was thinking about childbirth. I've observed a few times, and I've seen some situations. And, and ladies, tell me if I'm wrong, but especially in a natural childbirth, that process is not always happy and enjoyable. There's some work. There's some pain. There's some, there's some pressing, right, that you have to go through, some, some heavy breathing, some whatever you got to do, right, to, to get there. There's some of that. But after all of that, and for some of you, you're like, yeah, it was a long time, right? It's a, there's a process. That's why it's called labor. But what comes out at the end in, in the healthy situations, right, is a, is a new birth. And I don't know, maybe I've missed some, but I've never seen a new mother mad and like, no, I'll just take that thing back. It, was, it, it ain't worth it. But when they get that child and they lay it upon their chest, all of a sudden it's worth it. Right? And that's where we are today. The, the things that we're going through in life, they, they may be painful right now. It may be a struggle. You may have to keep pressing. You may have to keep breathing. You may have to, you know, lay down for a while. You, you may need some help. You may need some encouragement. But what God wants to do in us, to, to birth something new in us, to, to make us more like him, to, to lead us to that next step, to that next ministry, right, to that next calling, whatever that may be, it's worth it. It's worth it. So don't give up. Now, this is not a physical comment against any women who chose this route physically, but in the, in the supernatural, don't choose the epidural. Don't look for that ease, that, that way out, that, God, I, I still want the new thing, but I don't want to have to deal with any of the pain. I don't have to deal with any of the process. I just want you to take it away and make it easy. He may choose to do that. So if you want to pray, go ahead, but ask him what he really wants. Because most of the time, he may just want you to stay faithful. Because it says perseverance, perseverance, perseverance has to produce its work so that we can be mature, we can be complete, we can be made whole. And so in the end, when we choose joy and we choose wisdom and we choose humility, we're on that path towards becoming more and more like Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we bless you today. God, you love us enough to be patient with us. And to bring things into our life at times that we don't always understand and it doesn't always make sense. And it's not always you because sometimes it's just the evil of the world. But in the midst of all of that, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, you still have a way of showing up and working in it to bring something good, to, to bring us into a place to be more like you. And I pray for that for all of us today. So that would be the desire of our heart. And I pray now for if there's some that are here or listening and they haven't even made that commitment to, to follow you and to live for you, that this would be the day that they would realize they need you and that the, the, the journey of life has been incomplete and lacking because they haven't had your joy, your wisdom, your grace. And I pray for those now that are, that are feeling that urging that you would move by your spirit and touch their hearts. And for the rest of us that may know you and we are committed to you, but maybe we've been wavering in some ways. Maybe we've been we've complaining too much. Maybe we've lost sight of the purpose. God, bring us back in line so that we could say we're living from that place. God, do what you want in us so that we can become more like you. Move through the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray today. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.